Hey, what's going on everybody? In this video, we're going to be doing my July wrap-up and going over the 13 books that I finished in the month of July. Um, I felt it was pretty good. Some of the books were pretty small, but there was one uh, fairly large fantasy novel in there. But yeah, let's just go over to the bookshelves and let's get started. Alright, so let's start with the five books I finished at the beginning of the month to uh, complete my uh, 12 Owls. Um, for the Owls Readathon, so I can participate this month in the Noops. And the first book is Dennis uh, McKiernan's The Dark Tide, and this is the first book in the Iron Tower trilogy. And what this is, is basically a very um, traditional fantasy in the cut of Tolkien. Um, I mean, there's literally Hobbit-like people, uh, known as uh, Waros. But at least they can fight and stuff, so that's kind of cool. Um, it definitely uh, had the Tolkien-esque feel to it, and the uh, the author admits that he was like he's like hugely inspired by Tolkien and all that. Um, some people criticize that it's like a, just a complete ripoff of the Lord of the Rings. I wouldn't go that far, but it, like I said, it is very you can easily um, see the influences, obviously with like the Hobbits. Um, also, there's like an Aragorn-like character and things of that nature. But um, I felt. Like, after um, thinking about it after a while, it did have a lot of yeah, unique dark elements um, of its own. And I gave uh, The Dark Tide 3 out of 5 stars, but I'm going to uh, finish the trilogy, um, see if it picks up. Um, it was just kind of, just a little too traditional uh, for my taste. Alright, and now the next book is a history book. The Hittites and Their Contemporaries in Asia Minor by G.J. McQueen. Um, this was just a traditional uh, narrative history of the Hittites, um, an ancient Bronze Age people of Anatolia, or what is mostly where modern Turkey is today. But uh, the interesting um, aspect of this book was that it had tons of illustrations and images uh, throughout the book. Of course, I flipped to a page that has none. Um, but as you can see, there's lots of photographs and diagrams and things of that nature throughout the book. And that was its kind of big selling point. I think there's like 150 or 160, something like that. Um, it was pr really good. Um, there was a couple interesting um, sides and uh, discussions into like random, not random, but uh, kind of minute historical ideas. And like I mentioned, I think before in another video, it deals or it had like a couple pages dedicated to where the Hittites and where Bronze Age peoples in general got their tin resource. Um, which is obviously the second component um, to make bronze um, along with copper, but tin is actually a fairly hard resource to come by in the Near East, especially with the methods and technologies that were available at the time. So I thought it had some pretty good, um, interesting discussions. Um, but like I said, most of the actual Hittite content is pretty straightforward. Um, doesn't uh, deal into too much controversial stuff there. But overall, I gave the Hittites four out of five stars. Okay, the next book is a fantasy book, and it's the second book in the Riddle Master trilogy. And this uh, second book is um, Air of Sea and Fire, and this by Patricia McKillop. Um, these were some uh, fantasy books written in the 70s, and I really, really enjoy them. They're kind of, they're obviously shorter than like your average fantasy book now, but um, they have just a re really simple and fresh style to them. Um, I just found really interesting. And this one was cool because the first book... Um, is from the perspective of Morgan. Instead of um, having multiple perspectives, the first book, like, it's all told through Morgan, and then the second book is told through um, the perspective of uh, Ray Derley, uh, who is on the cover there. And she's basically discovering, she has, there is magic inherent in this world, though it's very kind of vague and uh, interesting. But like I said, like, I mentioned uh, in another video, that cover actually takes place um, as a scene in the book against that guy. Um, so yeah, it's actually pretty cool. She's like basically uber bold and determined. Um, and like I said, she has magic powers, but it's not like she can just like do kind of whatever. Um, she's basically more just discovering uh, herself. And pretty much everyone that has magic powers doesn't... No one... You don't really get trained in it or anything. It's just sort of like all like mental like, riddle stuff with your own, like, mind, almost. It's kind of interesting. So, yeah, I highly recommend, um, Air of Sea and Fire and the Riddle Master Trilogy, or the Riddle Master Trilogy. Four and a half out of five stars, I believe, to Air of Sea and Fire. Then I read the second book in the Gentleman Bastard sequence. Um, I really, really enjoyed The Lies of Locke Lamora, so I wanted to keep going with the series, and I read Red Seas Under Red Skies by Scotland. 
And I didn't like this one quite as much as the first one, um, but it was still really, really good. The characterization between Jean and Locke is tremendous. Um, I don't like the uh, sort of flashback scenes that start these fantasy books sometimes. I just I just don't care for them. I think they're kind of cheesy and misleading and all that. They're just kind of there to like kind of hook you because it's so ridiculous sometimes. But that's kind of how I felt with this one. Um, and then I felt some of the scenes were kind of contrived and forced, um, just sort of uh, spur of the moment type stuff. But still, I'm giving Red Season or this guy's four and a half stars just because I love the characters so much and Scott Lynch's writing style is superb. And the last one for the Owls is the second book in the Black Company uh, series by Glenn Cook. And the second book is Shadows Linger. And this um, was a really good follow-up to the first one. It was, um, I don't know, how would I say, it's not a different style, but the plot um, is a completely different kind of plot compared to the first one. So it was really interesting. Uh, like, and one of the new characters that you meet is basically uh, just some like this shady innkeeper that's just like trying to make ends meet, and uh, it is just really cool. Um, I really enjoyed him, and it, like I said, it was just a diff It wasn't the exact same thing as the a continuation. Of, I mean, it was a continuation of the first book, obviously, but it, like I said, it was a completely different plot structure, and I just found that uh, really cool. So I'm giving uh, Shadows Linger four and a half out of five stars. Alright, so those were the five books I read for the Owls. Now, I also read a couple other things. I read Aesop's Fables just for a short uh, read one afternoon. Um, like I said, it's pretty short. I have this cool International Library Collector's Edition that are not like really worth anything, but they look kind of cool um, on the shelf. But, uh, like I said, it's Aesop's Fables. You guys have probably already... Well, even if you haven't read them, you you know of a lot of them. And they're pretty simple, like, obviously, like, the, um, oh, the tortoise and the hare is, like, the first uh, fable in the book. I don't know if it's always the first one, but in this one it was. And, like I said, they're all about a page or two in length, and I think there's about 150 or so, but there's always, like, a moral, you know, purpose to the story. And some of them are really interesting. Um, I'll probably share some of my favorite ones out of there uh, when I do a full book review. Okay, and now we're going on to the big fantasy book that I read this month that took out a big chunk of my time, and it was The Eye of the World by uh, Robert Jordan. This is obviously the first book in the Wheel of Time series. Um, like I said, I've been trying to read lots of different kinds of fantasy and stuff, and Wheel of Time is a big series that pops up all the time um, when I ask for recommendations. And I wasn't disappointed I read it. It was a little bit long, or uh, on the longer side, but... I felt some of the characters were kind of weak. Um, one was really annoying. And I like the... I think the plot could have been uh, cut down a little bit. I mean, literally, most of the book is literally just one long chase, essentially. Or um, a bunch of different chases that kind of meet up together. But uh, I just think a lot more could have been done in the book, I guess. Uh, but it's definitely a big gigantic world that's uh, being started and I'm going to read the second book which is The Great Hunt. I'm giving The Eye of the World uh, by Robert Jordan three and a half out of five stars and I'll be doing a obviously a, a review of pretty much all these books and this one I might try and get my friend Tim if I can uh, if we can get an afternoon or something lunch together or something see if we can do one of um, another long discussion panel type video that I did for uh, Way of Kings. All right. Next up, I read a bunch of books for the nonfiction readathon, and I'll leave a link uh, down below for that as well. And the first one I read, I read one of my Osprey publishing books, and this one was The Age of Charlemagne, and it's the 150th book in the Men at Arms series, I believe. And this one was written by David Nicole and illustrated by Angus McBride. They always have really great color illustrations. You guys are going to get tired of me saying that, um, as you can see. But they're very accurate um, and true to the time period or the uh, um, age or context involved. So that's always really cool. You can find really detailed, specific, um, correct information, which is always really cool. The only problem I had really with this book in particular was that, even though it's called The Age of Charlemagne, it's really the entire um, Carolingian Empire um, 
like pretty much the whole just Kingdom of the Franks. Uh, so it goes from I'd say about it was about Charles Martel in the early 700s through um, the the beginning of the Atonian um, dynasty of the Holy Roman Empire. So that's oh, past the year 1000. So it's obviously a lot more than just you know the generation or two of Charlemagne. So that was kind of the only disappointment, just because that obviously broadens the whole book up into basically all of Western Europe for like two or three centuries. And but still, still really good information, and all the animal, or excuse me, all the animals are starting to attack, the, uh, attack the tripod for whatever reason. So say hi to Soph and Daisy. Uh, but I'm giving the Age of Charlemagne three and a half out of five stars. Um, the next book, uh, I must well do the audiobook, and I read Deep, or I, I should say, I listened to Deep by James Nestor. Now, uh, this was a pretty interesting book. I picked it up on an Audible uh, daily deal just for the fun of it, and I'm really glad I did because it was something that I knew almost nothing about. Um, it was about, basically, hum humans and their capabilities underwater, and you kind of journey with the author as he tries to practice and learn free diving, which is basically just taking what, like, just regular air um, without like scuba or uh, any other apparatus or anything like that and just diving under the water just on breath alone and see like you know either how far down you can go or uh, basically how long you can you know, do stuff underwater and he does do a good job criticizing the whole competitive free diving movement which is as he explained has basically gone out of hand there's been like one, at least one fatality lots of people have been paralyzed or in comas um, like people coming up with like blood pouring out of their eyes and ears and stuff because they're basically just um, uh, being a little too cocky and just going just for numbers, you know, just how far down you can go. I mean, these competitive free divers are going three, four, five, six, seven hundred feet below um, the surface of the water, and obviously that's just you know highly dangerous. But he deals a lot with um, other things as well, though, like researchers that use free diving. Um, in their work because um, they're able to get closer and um, to animals in their natural state without things such as um, scuba gear on. So it comes in, uh, or free diving is really useful um, to other people, which is really cool. And he does deal a lot with um, biological mechanisms that the human body has to deal with being underwater um, for longer periods of time than most people um, think, you know, that they can handle. But there are basically functions and mechanisms that the body has that can maybe not counteract obviously being underwater because we're not you know designed to live underwater but the average person can easily go like more than a couple minutes and more than a few feet underwater um with just a little bit of practice and training so it's kind of interesting and i'm giving a deep four out of five stars and another one i read for the nonfiction fiction was what the dog knows sent science and the amazing ways dogs perceive the world by cat ward I know it's kind of interesting. <laughs> a woman named Cat wrote a book about dogs, but this book was essentially a, a kind of a combination of history and memoir of working dogs and cadaver dogs in particular. And basically, a lot of it is like a memoir-ish portion of her training her dog Solo um, to be a cadaver dog, basically al almost kind of on a whim, which is really interesting. And it shows all the like you know dedication and work and training and practice. Um, that's involved with that, and as well as um, basically our insights on going on several cases uh, where she took Solo um, basically as a working cadaver dog. So it was interesting, and there was also a lot of history uh, behind how basically the government and uh, agencies basically came to like start training uh, cadaver dogs. And let's just say dogs were not always the only animal. There were several other animals, such as uh, snakes, for example, pigs. Uh, lots of others that the kind of vultures uh, that they try to use as cadaver animals, but obviously dogs, you know, um, based on a couple, quite a few different factors, always end up sort of being the most well-rounded for these tasks. And she does deal with a couple other things, such as search and rescue and like water, uh, water cadaver dogs and uh, things of and scent and tracking stuff like that. So it was really interesting. Um, if you're a dog lover, you should definitely go check uh, what the dog knows out. And I'm going to give What the Dog Knows 4 out of 5 stars. Um, also, Cat Warren is like a professor of journalism. So she is pretty witty at, in some points. And she obviously knows um, how to tell and write a pretty good story and a good narrative. So that was uh, really good as well.
Alright, and lastly, for the last book of the nonfiction readathon, my favorite book of the month goes to A Naturalist Goes Fishing by James McClintock. And the uh, subtitle is Casting um, in Fragile Waters from the Gulf of Mexico to New Zealand's South Island. And the author is a professor of marine and polar biology, or of marine polar biology um, in Antarctica. Uh, but he goes fishing pretty much all over the world. He has connections and friends in many, many places. And he just obviously really enjoys uh, going fishing. But the cool thing about this book was it was like an awesome blend of like fish stories. Like basically him going fishing with his um, friends and making a new acquaintances. And you know like what he's using to catch fish and like kind of like his bait and lures and all that stuff. But then the sec another part is the science behind what the kind of fish he's catching, why they're unique and special and cool and all that, um, as well as the entire environment and ecosystem and the ecology of where this fish is located, whether that's, you know, New Zealand or Lake Manitoba in Canada or Antarctica or at, uh, where he's from in Alabama. So that was kind of cool. And then the third portion um, of almost every chapter was basically uh, basically segments on conservation, especially in the ecosystem or the area that... Uh, um, James McClintock is fishing in and basically how humans are basically messing it up and what we can kind of try and do to either reverse it or combat it or just um, slow the process down or something. So it was a great blend of science, um, fishing stories and uh, um, conservation which are topics that I really really enjoy and he blended it together in a really great way and a natural schools fishing is definitely one of the highlights of the year for me and it was interesting just because this was a book um, basically I picked up just sort of on a whim to try out a new genre which is like kind of the nature memoir um, because I know there are quite a few of them and it was on sale like on book outlet or something a couple months ago so I just picked it up um, basically on a whim, whim not really knowing what I was getting into but it turned out it was like one of my favorite books um, definitely in the top I'd say at least three books I've read so far this year so if you don't mind fishing and you like conservation and you like science, you should definitely go check out A Naturalist Goes Fishing by James McClintock. Alright, uh, this is kind of a weird book for me, is I always, I try to read one World War One book a month if I can, um, that doesn't always happen, but I was running out of time, and I was like, I kind of want to read something on World War One, but I want to get it done before the end of the month, and I really was looking, and I didn't think I could finish any of the <laughs> other ones that I saw, so I picked up, or I... I already had Flying Aces of World War One by Gene Gurney, and this was a book I picked up at a used bookstore, like, I want to say last year, uh, but it's basically a middle school book, uh, to be honest, uh, and I think it was put out by Scholastic from, like, the 60s, I think, 60s or 70s, uh, but it was just kind of an interesting little read, uh, I finished it in, like, a day or two, but, yeah, he basically goes over just a bunch of you know, famous uh, pilots from World War One. The the criticism I would have with the book is he only includes one um, uh, central power ace, uh, and that's obviously uh, the Red Baron Manfred von Richthofen in his uh, flying circus. But and all like I think the other like nine or ten are all pilots uh, from Allied countries. Though he did it with the Allied countries, he did spread it out between Britain and France and Belgium and Canada and the United States. So he did. Uh, Obviously, like, spread that out pretty good, but I felt there are lots of um, Central Power Aces as well. Uh, but it was just kind of an interesting uh, little book. In, like I said, uh, not much to it, just because it was, I think it's like a middle school age book, maybe. Uh, but it's just kind of one I had, just because I kind of liked the artwork on the cover, and I like pretty much everything World War One, so I picked it up for like a dollar at that used bookstore. So I figured it'd be a good chance to read it, since I knew I wasn't going to be able to finish anything else. So there's Flying Aces of World War One. And the last book I read it was a very short Oxford, very short introduction. I try to read one of those a month each, uh, or excuse, as well. And this one was by Catherine Osborne. And I actually really enjoyed this one. The only real critique I would have is she started the book off with a chapter on Empedocles. And he's like one of the notorious ones for being hard to understand. And she does go over his kind of his theory is pretty good um, but like I said they're kind of uh, they're not really complicated they're just the, Empedocles is just kind of weird to be honest um, if that intrigues you you should just like go check them out the problem is a lot of the priests are, are all the priests of Christ we don't really have much of their works we just have fragments and like pieces of 
of their text that have come down us through like other authors or by chance. So it's always hard to kind of piece things together. And he's like kind of one of those cases where we definitely probably could use a lot more context to figure out what he's talking about. But on the other hand, I will say Heracli her chapter on Heraclitus, who is probably the most notorious um, pre-Socratic philosopher for being like really vague and abstract. I, he's the one that says, you know, you can never uh, step into the same river twice. Uh, things of that nature but she does a really great chapter on him and i will say her whole um her whole book is structured really well in that a lot of the pre-socratics get kind of pigeonholed into just being cosmologists you know what is the foundation of everything where thales says oh everything's made of water or comes from water and anaximenes says oh no it's all from um the aether and anaximander says oh no it's all from the air um that sort of thing and here Clytus says Basically, you can kind of argue he basically makes the claim for fire, since basically fire is always changing, and the world is always changing, and fire is the only thing that is always in change. But anyways, the the problem with that is that's only like a tiny little bit of what all these guys were like talking about, and they didn't come right after each other every single time. Most Almost all these guys lived, you know, within a couple generations of each other. Um, obviously, there's a ton of overlap. But they get pigeonholed just into like one little piece of their theory just to make it kind of nice and neat to like write a, a book on them. But she does a really good job kind of explaining that, you know, it's going to be all over the place because they were all over the place. And I felt that actually worked out really well. So um, I'm giving pre-Socratic philosophy four and a half out of five stars for being the best um, book I've read on the topic so far. And there you guys have it. Those are the 13 books I finished in the month of July. I felt I had a really good reading month. Um, definitely, I seem to read fantasy a lot faster. So that's, uh, I think, a big thing. I read one, what, one, two, three, four, five, five-ish uh, fantasy books. And some of our Eye of the World was uh, uh, pretty big. So I felt that's probably what uh, helped me read quite a bit that month. Or, yeah, in the month of July. But, yeah, most of the... Oh, I had a pretty good reading month. I didn't have anything lower than a three, which is always really good. And I had quite... Um, I think the average was um, over four. So that's um, really good as well. So I picked some good choices. Um, I know that's not the case quite so far. Um, in the month of August, I've had a bunch of threes already. So you can't, like, can't win at all of them. But, uh, anyways... If you guys have read any of them, um, or if you have any questions or comments about any of them, leave them down below. I'd be glad to talk to you guys about them. I always enjoy uh, giving out other recommendations and just talking uh, to everyone about um, other books related to these ones or things of that nature. But like I said, yeah, if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. I'd be glad to talk to you. And whatever you guys are reading, always remember, read victoriously.